I cannot believe we talked this long. This podcast is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Spoiler warning for whatever is in the title of this episode. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Let the right one in. Let the old dreams die. Let the wrong ones go. They cannot do what you want them to do. Morrissey. So does that mean when there's a third one, it's going to be titled Let the Wrong Ones Go? Uh, I kind of hope so. Yeah. Welcome to episode 106 of The Horror of Babylon, where we are discussing... Hold on. Hold on. We are discussing... Fuck. (laughs) Tell me about fuck. Fuck. Um, okay. Uh, I'm a big fan. Mm, okay. Where we are discussing Let the Right One In by John Linquist. John Ed Linquist. Lin- <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, we are very sorry. We we just cannot pronounce Swedish names yet. Yeah. Well, that kind of implies that we're going to be able to at one point. I will try. <laughs> all right. That's all you can ever ask. Uh, I am Ryan, and with me, as always, is Daniel. I was going to uh, try to type in hello in Morse code, but I couldn't learn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's this bit in the office where uh, Jim and Pam are clicking their pins, like like going back and forth, clicking their pins, and, and Dwight's like, you guys are talking about me in Morris code. And he's and Jim's like, yeah, you're right, Dwight. We two parents of young children on a limited budget got baby centers and paid for a uh, mor- class on Morris code just so we could talk about you with our pens. And then it cuts to them in the in the interview room. And it's like, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> because he Dwight told Pam, I when are you going to lose the baby weight, Pam? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you <laughs> to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan, the, the Full, full metal, metal Patron, patron and Ben the full First. Part. For a fourth, <laughs> not the first. That's Abigail. Uh, ben the fourth, patron of hope, and me the fifth, the Raymaker. She makes it rain. Oh, she makes it rain. And thank you to Forceman Comics and Gaming, which you can uh, visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, the Mall Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You can shop online at shop.forcemancomics.com, and you can visit their new store in. Stockholm, Sweden, a Four Horsemen Comics in Lutefisk. Lutefisk. I thought for sure you were going to say, and speaking of people who don't need to lose the baby weight. Um, I almost did. <laughs> I was so ready for you. To... Yeah, I, I almost did. That was the joke. Um, uh... But speaking of somebody who never lost their baby weight, thank you to Ronald the Third, Grampus of Christmas. <laughs> he uh, looks good with it. Yeah, I, I also have the dad bod, so no shame, Ron. No shame. Um, trigger warning, all of it. Yeah. Child, child death, pedophilia, sexual assault, bullying, substance abuse, existential loneliness. Just like every, like, and not just like every psychological issue <laughs> that you can, you can ha- yeah, somebody has, if not feelings of inadequacy. Yeah. Like, um, like abusive parents, but, and it's not of a lot of them aren't even like outright abusive it's like that soft abuse like they're trying but they're doing something bad and they don't even realize that they're doing something bad yeah 
like Ben's mom and it. She yeah. just she feeds him too much and she doesn't realize what she's doing is wrong. Uh, okay, but our history would let the right one in. Uh, I had never read it, but I was just aware of it because you you bring it up regularly. That's and I know there are two movies and, and a TV show now. In a TV show and a comic book and a short story sequel. Yeah. And a, there's been a couple plays yes. also, which I think would be fun. Yeah. That would be fun. Um, maybe if something like that ever happens in Pittsburgh. But, okay, and yours. Um, so you've known me for a long time. Uh, you know that, especially back in college, I had a huge vampire obsession to the point where I tried to make uh, vampires work in magic for the longest time. Yep. Um, and so I started hearing about this movie called Let the Right One In, and this was maybe not at, like, Twilight's peak, but it was the, the Twilight people were still around. The first one came out in 2008, I think. Yeah. So I that's pretty... That's pretty maybe not peak, but pretty close. Yeah. Like somewhere around there. So I started hearing about this movie in college, and uh, so I got on my way to uh, buy it, because I see it in Walmart. And I watch it, and I'm like, this is the best vampire movie I've ever seen. Some years go by, the remake comes out, I watch the remake, and then I finally get around to reading the book. And I'm like, this book has so much more in it. As most books <laughs> normally do. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then I eventually I read, uh, I can't even remember when I read the, the short story sequel. That would have to have been after I graduated college, sometime after that. And that short story is titled, Let the Old Dreams Die, which is why we speculate that a third one would be called, Let the Wrong Ones Go, based on that. The vampires are pure myth, superstition. I may be able to bring you proof that the superstition of yesterday can become the scientific reality of Today. Background: This uh, novel was written by John Lindquist. Yeah. <laughs> Lindquist. He was uh, born on December second, nineteen sixty-eight. The this was his debut novel, and then he followed it up with *Handling the Undead*, a zombie novel. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, have you read any of his other books? Nope. No, nope. they've been on my list for a while. I just haven't gotten around to them. I'm I'm interested in reading more. Maybe. Maybe in season three, like, okay, let's do another St Stephen Graham Jones book. Let's do another John Lindquist book. Let's see um, if they can keep it up. Yeah. Uh, he was also a writer for the television series Ruder and Skoog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that sounds should, better in Swedish. We should change our names to Ruder and Skoog. <laughs> do you get to be Ruder or Skoog? We'll play magic for it. Oh. <laughs> Because I want to be Ruder, yeah. but I I, I can be Skoog. <laughs> uh, how about you? You can be either Ruder or Skoog, and I'll be Wheels. <laughs> and the like, man. Yeah. <laughs> we need to do that cosplay. Um, my next cosplay is going to be the teacher from Battle Royale 2. <laughs> <laughs> Who I forgot to mention in that episode looks just like Way uh, Wayne Newton. Yeah. <laughs> forgot. To, I meant to bring that up. Uh, ba 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 ba. Uh, he also wrote the screenplay for the television drama series Commission. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And and he, he wrote the uh, screenplay for Let the Right One In. The, Swe the Swedish movie. Yeah. Uh, he's written a lot of novels, various short stories, uh, screenplays, and plays. He names Morrissey as an inspiration, like a lot of people do. Some of his stories were influenced by his father's drowning, which drowning does come up. In this book, uh, "Let the Right One In" was first published in 2004. So, relatively recent book. Most of this, yeah. most of the stuff we read is not that new. Didn't come to America till 2007. Yeah. Uh, the title is a reference to Morrissey's "Let the Right One Slip In," which we quoted at the beginning of the episode. It is a bestseller and it's been translated into several several languages. There's been two film adaptations, a Swedish and an American version, TV show on Showtime, I yep. think. Uh, there is a comic book, which we will be reviewing, as well as both the movies and the stage play and the short story sequel that we mentioned, which it was in a collection of short stories, but yeah. he, he included the, a sequel to his novel in that collection. Um, he, include, he wrote that story specifically because of fan theories that came up because of the movies. That's fun. Because people didn't read the novel. <laughs> hmm. 
<laughs> so he wrote a short story to explain the ending. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Maybe I'll try to read that before I watch the movie. That pr- probably won't work because I got to get those movies watched. Yeah. Um, and in October 2022 interview, John L- Lindquist mentioned that he had nothing to do with the TV show and lamented inadvertently selling all the rights to the book for only one SEK. It's basically a penny. One penny. When yeah. he thought he was only giving Hammer Films the right to make the movie, meaning he will earn no royalties from the TV show. Uh, I wonder if he had a lawyer read the contract. Probably not. Um, from what I was able to gather, uh, he signed it and like talked about how they used a bunch of like lawyer double speak to him. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing because you know, let the right one. It was his debut novel. Uh, maybe this was like the first time he'd been like getting that kind of attention. So he probably didn't have his own representation. Didn't have a lot of experience with it. I bet he only makes that mistake once. Yes. Yeah. Well, which is unfortunate, but yeah, unfortunate. That's how the entertainment business goes. That's from what I was able to do through very limited research. Seems to be what the case was. There may have also been a language barrier. And that's that. Another story in the classic, infallible three-act structure. Good enough for Aristotle, good enough for The Simpsons. Mr. Sislak, I have a feeling there's going to be one more act to this story. Well, I'm not hanging around for that. Four acts. Structure and themes. So, third-person omniscient with shifting character er, perspective, but, like, it shifts within chapters as well. Yeah. But it's broken up by days, so there's no the chapters aren't numbered. They're chapter by the date. Yeah. But also like morning of or afternoon of. Yeah, culminating on Friday the thirteenth. Yeah, which <laughs> I don't know if I love or is just a little like oh come on. <laughs> I kind of love it because I feel like it's the oh come on on purpose. <laughs> I didn't look it up, but I meant to look it up if that date in 1981 actually was Friday the thirteenth. Let me okay, so November thirteenth it was November, right? Yes. November thirteenth, nineteen eighty one. Uh what what day of the week was November thirteenth, nineteen eighty one? It was, it, was a, it was a Friday. Okay, okay cool. so that's fair. <laughs> he he did more research than I would have. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awesome if it was Friday the thirteenth? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it just it just uh, occurred to me that Oscar Meyer. How was Oscar reading Goosebump books in 1981? Were they not out in 1981? <laughs> now that you say that, because <laughs> I didn't read them until like the 90s. Yeah, I, I thought they were released in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! John! <laughs> John! <laughs> John, you did so much other research. <laughs> Because that occurred, it, it takes place in 1981, and I, I loved that this kid reads Goosebumps and he reads Stephen King. He was reading Firestarter. When was Firestarter published? I think that's 1980. Okay, okay so, so that's fair. Um, so I was gonna say like uh, that kid's about to live through the 80s and like the 80s boom of horror movies and he's gonna love it and then it occurred to me because like he reads Goosebumps I was like it's 1981 I thought the Goosebumps came out in the night I uh, didn't even think of that oh my god John I mean it doesn't ruin the book it doesn't matter but, but it is is a little awkward I, I find that a little bit more funny especially when he got Friday the 13th correct yeah yeah well maybe he didn't look that up he just got lucky yeah <laughs> I kind of want that to be the case. Or now. Ma- maybe he looked up Goosebumps and he read it as eighty-eight. Well, even that'd be eighty-two. So, yeah, n- n- I don't. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so, I, on the structure, it w- it mostly made sense to me. There were a few times where it shifted character perspectives mid chapter, and I was kind of lost for a minute. Yeah. I think it might have been easier if I had the physical book in front of me because we yeah. did, I did we both did this on audiobook this what, time around. That type of thing is usually harder on audiobook. One other thing that may I think made it a little more difficult is that there's a lot of subplots with tertiary characters. <laughs> yeah. Some of which that only show up like a couple times, like uh, one of the bullies' older brother, Jimmy, mm-hmm. like. 
and one of the other main plots is focused around a kid named Tommy and I there's another bully named Thomas yeah and there's Thomas and I'm and there's also a Johnny Mm -hmm. there's a Jimmy a Johnny a Thomas and a Tommy Uh, there's also Stefan the cop but in the epilogue, the guy who's punching, like, his, his name is Stefan. Stefan. <laughs> I, I actually thought, I was like, did he get fired? Did he have to get another job? <laughs> so there were some moments of confusion, but overall, I think the structure worked pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I wrote down that it has uh, shades of epistolary uh, storytelling because there are times where it's like, from the newspaper of mm-hmm. uh, especially at the end of the novel when they're talking about like the autopsy report but it's only giving you snippets of the autopsy and it gives you just like a like a script from a newscast yeah like this is this is the six o'clock news and this is what's going on blah, 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 blah. yeah yeah i feel i feel like a lot of vampire stories do this because of dracula <laughs> Which is fair. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the greatest novels of all time. Because, you know, we had that in uh, Salem's Lot. We had that in... Uh, we have that in this. Um, A Dowry of Blood yeah. is actually more of an epistolary novel than either of them. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just a long-ass journal. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, that is... Or confession letter. Yeah, it was a confession letter. But interesting. Um, okay. Uh, is there anything else unique about the structure? Um, yeah, pitch to Ryan. <laughs> I didn't think so, but I, sometimes you have uh, takes or insights that I don't, so. No. I don't really think so. Okay, then we could. I can. think it where this book kind of is different is in its take on vampires. Yeah. Um... So let's go to themes. Sexual deviance. That's a pretty way of <laughs> saying something pretty bad. <laughs> I, sexual sexual deviance could be like Hank and Peggy having sex on a train, <laughs> or it could be going to a library and uh, <laughs> buying sex from a twelve-year-old boy. <laughs> Uh, whenever I took my uh, deviant behavior course for my criminal justice degree, uh, pedophilia was indeed a topic. It is a topic. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say that it caught me off guard, and <laughs> I wasn't super happy about it. <laughs> we have a new rule for the podcast. <laughs> I need a warning. <laughs> the difference between a book like this and a book like Lolita is that it's not it's a part of the book but it's not the book yeah like you can excise the pedophilia from this book and still have a story but it it is lolita that's yeah, yeah that's, that's the story that's the that's the that's the only story totally. I, I was actually i played a, uh, a game with myself to try and if you had to adapt lolita but make it so that humbert's not a pedophile so like you have to why does he marry fat Hayes? like he what does fat Hayes find out about him that makes her run out into traffic he's a furry why <laughs> why, why does he kidnap why does he kidnap Lo? like the same beats happen but you have to change his motivation if she's also a furry there's like no nothing sexual about their relationship he just wants to go to cons <laughs> You know and that's why they're traveling across the country. Is you know how that cons. would you know how that would work <laughs> yeah. as a web comic. People would read that. <laughs> I wish I could draw because I feel like there's an actual idea here now. No, you just do stick <laughs> figures because web comics don't have to be drawn well. They can look like crap, and thousands of people will still read them. I'll even just still call it Lolita. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, Lola Bunny. <laughs> so, and, and we we've talked about this. Like, so if you haven't read it, one pause this, read the book, and come back to us. Like, or, mm. or don't even come back to us. Cause read the book. But if you haven't read it, the the main vampire is a uh, well. For now, we'll just say a young child, or appears to be a young child, and their familiar is a middle aged pedophile. And you mentioned, and we were talking about this the other day, and you mentioned that it makes sense if you were a a quote-unquote immortal vampire who looks like a kid, and you're trying to find an adult who's going to take care of you, 
that's a person you could easily manipulate. Yeah, you either grab that or somebody who wants to be a vampire down the road. Uh, and in the book's defense, like, it only really does, like, two or three, like, scenes to really get the point across that he's a pedophile. Yeah. And they're gross and they're terrible, but it does it does feed the story. There is a purpose to it. It's not just shock value. I also feel like this is one of those very rare instances uh, where they wrote the pedophile as, like, an actual character. <laughs> Yeah. Like, um, like, there's this weird conflict about it for him. Um, he knows it's bad, and he feels guilty about it. Yeah. It's so much, like, even, even more so, he seems, even though he kills people. Yeah. <laughs> he seems to be, have a lot more of a line than Humbert does. Yeah. He, he, he's like, no, nah, I can't do that. But that's only if I'm being generous. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I wasn't being generous, I was thinking... You know, I bet you he really didn't just fuck this kid in the library because he's just not as hot as Ellie. <laughs> or Eli. Ed, Eli, yeah. Eli. Eli. <laughs> Elias. Um, <laughs> but, so that that's Hawkins. Humber, yeah. I called him Humbert Hawkins. Yeah, Humbert Hawkins. H-H. H-H. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Uh, we'll come back to that. Unconventional relationships. There's lots of unconventional relationships. Yeah, it's a big theme of the book. Oscar and Eli... Um, Virginia and Laka. Laka. Because there's Laka, there's Yaka. Waka and Dot. <laughs> I don't. A lot, a lot of the names are similar. Um, Oscar's parents, Oscar's who, parents, who are broken up but neither have another relationship. Yep. Um, there, there's lots. Uh, that's a big one. Broken families. Like every, I don't think there is a family in this that isn't broken. The bully's family is a broken family. Tommy's family is not broke. His father died. His but. father died, and she's getting remarried, which that's not unconventional, but that is kind of a, uh, uh, you know, just it's his first family was broken from his father's death. It's a blended family. Yeah, it's, it's a stepfather and a stepson. It's not. It's not a traditional heteronormative nuclear family. Yeah. Uh, Farther, fatherlessness was listed as a theme on the Wikipedia. Absolutely. Um, and I thought that was funny because when I was listening to this book, uh, uh, there were moments where I was going, man, this is real fatherless behavior. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It, I mean, even <laughs> Stefan points out that Tommy wouldn't act this way if he had his dad around. Yeah, but he just needs a good ass whooping and a father figure. So Oscar doesn't have regu a regular interactions with his dad. His dad's still in his life, but he's not not how he sh how it should be. Mm -hmm. Tommy doesn't have a dad. His father died. Johnny and Jimmy, their father is. Uh, out on an oil, working on an oil rig and finally sending child support. Yeah, and Ile obviously their dad is dead, and they have a surrogate father in Humbert Hawkins, but <laughs> who just wants to like cuddle with them. Yeah, it kept <laughs> uh, generously kept reminding me of a uh, Mitsuko Soma in the manga, just saying, "Daddy's little girl, Daddy's little girl." Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> it was really bad. Um, violence, cycles of violence, escalation of violence, the bullying. Yeah. Obviously, the it, vampires. I mean, I, I uh, thought that bullying, and we'll get into this with down further down. But bullying tied really good into like the as a parallel for the vampirism and the way violence can escalate. Yeah. And I, I can. I'm broken as an individual. I can only think in terms of memes. Have you seen that like the, those quiet kid memes? Like maybe the, the quiet kid tell when the quiet kid tells you not to come to school tomorrow. That's maybe. what I kept thinking of. Oscar gives me this is how you make a school shooter vibes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have a lot to say on Oscar. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's a very unique, very deep character. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, like the way that bullies regularly prey on weaker kids is very similar to how vampires have to suck blood from their victims. And then the bullies cry whenever they hit back. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined my ear. You see what he did to his ear. Um, I'm going to mention. OK, so this is a book uh, from a Swedish author about Swedish characters. It takes place in Sweden. 
the audiobook is read by a gentleman with a very British accent, mm. and it I found it like it sometimes like people say like they don't say Britishisms because that's not how it was written, but it sounds very British. It does the, sound very British, which was a little distracting. It sounds very Dracula. Yeah, but that's okay. Okay, um, social isolation. I mean. Uh, Oscar the character. <laughs> yeah, that's him in a nutshell. Yeah. But it's also about a lot of people who are just, like, on the fringes of society. Mm -hmm. Like, drunks, people who, like, single, childless people. Um, there's lots... N none of the homeless people are characters, but they're constantly mentioned mm -hmm. throughout the book. Uh, single parents, just, like, people who are just up against... Up against it. Up again it. They're up again it. Um, but yeah, I mean Oscar primarily. He's he just has no friends and he has his one friend who's like the worst friend. He he's the fair weather friend. Yeah. Who looks the other way when the bullies are around. That's basically all of my friends in high school. Yeah. It's shitty. <laughs> uh young love and relationships, uh Oscar and Eli. This was th when this first came out, I already mentioned this, this was like being pitched as the good Twilight is how people used to pitch this movie. I've never read or watched Twilight, so I can't really comment, but I, I can see it, I guess. Yeah, it when you boil it down to vampire and non-vampire in a relationship. Uh, I was comparing it more to Carmilla yeah. than, uh, than Twilight, because I, I haven't read Twilight. Emma, uh, Emma asked me yesterday if uh, she could read Carmilla, and I was, like, yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, it's not she's not the lesbian icon you ho hope she's going to be, but you I, you still might like it. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I I also kind of compare I compare it to Salem's Lot a lot. Carmilla and Salem's Lot were the two books that I was comparing it most to. Um. It's like a Salem's Lot where the vampire doesn't really want to invade. It just wants to move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm looking for a place to live. In fact, Eli is going out of their way to, like, not make more vampires. Yeah. Is the point. Like, I need blood, but I don't want any more vampires. I don't even really want this Hawkins guy, <laughs> but I kind of need him. Yeah. Oscar, I, I love at the end of the book. Oscar, would you ever want to be like me? No! <laughs> not not particularly. But I do want, but I will be with you. Which is, this will come up as we watch the movies, which, at what point does their relationship become creepy? Or is it ever creepy because of where they started out? Well, also, like, does their relationship continue to be romantic? Or is is it even romantic at the end of the book? There's also a question to, because Oscar brings this up, we'll get more into this when we get into characters. Oscar brings this up a couple of times. I think the book leans more towards being generous to Ile, mm -hmm. but there are a couple lines in this book where Oscar kind of speculates, how much is Ile lying to me about how their mind works? Yeah. Do they actually have this really ancient and manipulative mind and they just know how to survive versus are they stuck in the mind of a child? Yeah. Where... It's on the surface. It seems like Ile does have the mind of a child, but there are these little moments. Yeah, that could just be like her, their chess master. Yeah, your plan. Okay, we need to get to characters, but let's keep going. Death, duh. Yeah, I mean, come on. The Cold War. Yeah, <laughs> there's a Soviet sub that's come. I was so disappointed <laughs> that never became important. I thought you might be. Yeah, it's the only reason I listed it I, as a theme. I meant to look this up and I forgot. I, I wanted to see if a Soviet sub actually did get beached in Sweden. If, that, in if he got that right, but not Goosebumps. Soviet sub beached in Sweden in 1981. In October 1981, the Soviet submarine S-363 accidentally hit an underwater rock about 10 kilometers from the south coast of the naval old base in Swedish waters. The boat, so yes, <laughs> that happened. So and I'm, I'm guessing nothing came of it in real life, which is why nothing comes of it in the book. He just must've thought it was really interesting. And that's why he chose it. It is, I mean, and like, that's like Reagan year. So that's like 
pretty not height of the cold wars because that's I, bay of pigs I, but i guess it could tie into the idea of escalation of violence is mm -hmm. the only thing that i could tie it to but i'm just saying like yeah it would make everyone t feel tense yeah like and sweden is not so far away from russia but politically very far away from well i mean they do mention that there is a, a communist party that's fighting with a conservative you're gonna party, fight but, you're gonna vote for the conservatives but typically you would I, actually sweden's pretty neutral in most global conflicts so never yeah mind. okay um substance abuse who isn't yeah. doing a drug in this book oscar steals to get high uh, Tommy was sniffing pain at the end, and we have an entire list of characters that I just labeled as the drunks. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a parallel to vampirism. Yeah. Uh, that, which a lot of people write vampires to be allegories for something. I I got that, especially with Virginia, when she's sucking her own blood, and she's like, I'm just going to do this once to just get me through the night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very much And felt then there's like... diminishing returns on her own blood. It very much felt like an allegory for alcoholism or drug use yeah. or, or playing WoW. It doesn't really matter. Just insert your addiction. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Let's go to characters. Oscar. Piss wow. Ball. <laughs> piss ball was my first. I even posted in our Discord. Like, I need to know how a piss ball works. It's just a little foam condos he wears on his penis to absorb some pee. I feel like... I pee too much for that to be even remotely helpful. I'm guessing, like, when he gets scared, it's like a it's trickle. Just, it's just like, yeah. Like a little trickle. Not like a... But, like, enough that might be, like, noticed on the pants, but yeah. not enough to, like, really wet them. I think I probably could have used that a few times growing up. Uh, I... Th this wasn't written right under Pissball, but it was written. I wrote that he's just a weird kid who does weird kid things. Yes. And it just made me think of, you're a dad. So yeah. I, I'm sure your kids have probably done something weird that just makes you go, why would you do this? Yes. Um, but I'm also sure that when we were kids, we did something that we that made a logical sense to us in the moment. When I first read this book, I related to Oscar so much just over this because I'm like, this seems like some weird shit I would do if I had this problem. I did until I didn't. There was a significant portion of this book, primarily in like the first third of it, mm -hmm. where I thought that this was going to end with Oscar becoming an actual serial killer. <laughs> Like, he does everything except for, like, actually killing and torturing animals. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, is he just a kid who's interested in serial killers? Or is he, like, on that path? Uh, I think I can explain this. Okay. I he, thought you could. He's an edgelord. <laughs> he he uh, is being bullied, so he feels completely out of control in his own life. So he has a power fantasy, but it just so happens that the power fantasy he latches onto are serial killers instead of superheroes or whatever have you. Mm -hmm. And I only know this because I was a fucking edgelord little kid. I wasn't serial killers uh, myself, like actual ones, mm -hmm. but I was really into shit like Dexter or horror movies or vampires. Vampires were my big thing. Why were vampires my big thing? because I was bullied and I had fucking power fantasies about becoming a vampire and just being able to murder things. Ripping people's head off in a pool. Yeah. That's that's why I related to Oscar because I was like, he's doing all this weird kid shit and I recognize the power fantasy that he's gotten trapped into because he just won't tell his mom what's going on. He does tell her. <laughs> yeah. And she's she tells him he's full of shit. <laughs> Granted, he... The thing he tells her about is the thing that he's completely wrong about. Like, Mom, I'm becoming a vampire. Like, no, yeah, you're not. I I'm just talking about, like, yeah. him being bullied. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't talk to his like, mom about like that. Like, he doesn't take... He doesn't go to the teachers. He doesn't talk to his mom. He doesn't talk to his doesn't dad. doesn't do anything actually practical when he should. Yeah. There's lots of reasons people in those situations don't. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize a lot of that, especially on this lesson. Mm-hmm. Um... So he hasn't, he, he, I don't 
want to call children amoral because they're still figuring shit out but he he definitely has like some questionable moral tendencies like like he shoplifts like i i shoplifted when i was a kid it's it's a thing that some kids do Mm -hmm. um he he seems to idolize murderers he and this is not something that's unique to him because kids just don't understand I mean we don't really understand death either but even more so as a kid like when someone is murdered his concern isn't that a child lost their life his concern is like ooh how did it happen did what I, happened did I accidentally kill that kid by stabbing <laughs> the tree <laughs> and then he has like this elaborate fantasy that he actually has a superpower and I'm like oh dude if this could be any more me <laughs> um and you get a lot on his parents. Yep. And neither of his parents are like explicitly bad, but they both do more so his dad, but they both do bad things. Uh, I think I wrote down the one that I think is the worst for his mother, which is she accepts Oscar's words, not because she believes him, but because that's the, it's easier. Yeah. It's, oh, he walked into a tree. He's not being bullied because being bullied would require like you have to go talk to the principal. You have to talk to the teacher. You have to do something. You might have to teach your kid a life lesson. Like, maybe sometimes you have to hit back. And it's also accepting that other kids have a problem with your child. Yeah. Um, which can be hard. I, I've been in that situation. And it's it's hard to accept that your kid isn't universally liked by all people. Yeah. Because you love your cl- your kid with unconditionally. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, if you've read it, they're, they're bad parents like Ben's mom, not like Bev's dad or Eddie's mom. Yeah. Um, I was... When he goes and visits his dad, I was like, oh, this is so sweet. He, it's so wholesome. He and, loves his dad and, so much. Until it isn't. <laughs> and it's not even like... So if you just you just say, oh, his, his dad had a friend came over and they had some drinks and he didn't talk to his kid as much. But when you don't see your kid every day and your kid comes to visit you as a special trip, you tell your friend, hey, mate, do you mind coming by tomorrow night instead? Yeah. You you make it about your kid because you don't see your kid every day. And then Oscar even has, like, you know, his, like, a little internal monologue about how this always happens. Yeah, it's not a one-time thing. It happens every time because his dad is an alcoholic. He never hit us. Yeah. He never hit us, yeah. which is good. Yeah. But, he but still... he'll come in and he'll cry and he'll want attention. Which is its own kind of abuse. Yeah. yeah. But his his needs aren't at his his meet his needs are met. His parents do love him, but they are real flawed people who make mistakes. And I wrote down I think this line's even used that he never grew into fatherhood. He's a guy who is a dad who doesn't know how to be a father. Yeah, he's better at being his son's friend yeah. than he is at... And when I'm talking about fatherless behavior, the piss ball is fatherless behavior. Uh, being bullied and just doing what the bullies want every single time mm-hmm. is... You didn't have your dad there to tell you sometimes you are you might get hurt, but sometimes you might have to push back a little bit. Or you might have to go tell an authority figure. Yeah depending on your parenting style. Mm-hmm. That, that, Do, doing anything, doing either of those things is generally better than... Than letting them walk put your head you. in a toilet and yeah. pushing your nose up and making you squeal. Yeah, squeal piggy, squeal piggy. Uh, I I can't remember if they gave us like an exact body type form, but I was imagining him in this book like like suit, like a chubby little kid. They said he was overweight. Oh, okay, so he was overweight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the movies, he's played by the skinniest fucking kids. They always, <laughs> always do that. Like, every every time a character is overweight, they always change it for the movie. Unless it's like a Ben Hanscom type character where that's like his whole shtick is that he's fat. But the worst part is, is they still make him do the squeal piggy things. And so I'm sitting there going, is this a deliverance reference now? Because in the book, it was because he was chubby. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, not cool, but at least yeah. like I, I can follow the logic of the bullies. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I think the rest of the discussion with Oscar is about his relationship with Eli. 
So first we'll talk about Ile slash Elias. And I just, I love that your first note is just vampire. vampire. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't get that. <laughs> I didn't pick up. Well, to, in your defense, Ile does say they're not a vampire. <laughs> I'm like, I, uh, bullshit. I only, do, I only do all the things that vampires do and have to follow a lot of the rules. Okay. I have a lot to say on Eli as well, but we can we, we can start off with the whole... We, we kind of talked about this already, where they say they've been 12 for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And there's parts of the book that kind of make that seem correct, and there's other parts where you're like, is that is that true? Mm -hmm. um, I was comparing it a lot to Interview with the Vampire, the little kid vampire in that. She mentally ages, mm -hmm. but her body never does, and it starts to drive her insane. The... the uh, example that I could think of was the uh, mermaid kid. Yeah. Uh, I forget his name, but the immortal little kid in Mermaid Saga who he doesn't mature. Like, he can gain intelligence over the years. But no, no like, emotional intelligence. Yeah, so he's still, like, a kid. And I mm. think he was, like, 600 years old or yeah. something like that. Um, the other one was the kid from Near Dark. Yeah. The kid who's just like, I can never get a fuck. <laughs> That's a pretty good example. Yeah. <laughs> the Near Dark podcast. That's a versus thing, is Ile versus the little kid from Mermaid Saga. That'd be cool. I'd watch that. Yeah, that'd be all right. But no, we're going to get Batman versus Superman for the umpteenth time. Oh, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. Um, I love Ile. I think they are an excellent character. Um, I think the the high point of the book is just the initial uh, befriending and initial like romantic entanglement between Oscar and Ile. It is some of the most wholesome stuff. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it's surrounded by all this, like, not awful, not wholesome. awful shit. <laughs> Which I think that's probably where some of, like, the, the Twilight comparisons come in is, like, when you get, like, these little moments, mm -hmm. only it's, like, written as, like, actual relationships. Like, how kids discover romance. It's usually a little bit weird, a little bit awkward. Yeah. But it's still kind of wholesome, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Nope, it does. Um, because there's nothing like there's nothing sexual to it. Yeah. Um, even though like Ile has this expectation that maybe e, that there's going to be because that's what they've learned from Humbert Hawkins and presumably other people. Yeah. Uh, she, do you want to kiss? No, I don't want to kiss. And then when they do kiss, it's just super sweet. But um, Ryan, I do have a question though. Mm -hmm. uh, would you still love me if I wasn't a boy? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I will say that John fooled me and when that line happened I, I assumed that Elay meant when they said would you still love me if I weren't a girl I assumed that Elay meant because I'm a vampire mm -hmm. not I am a boy <laughs> Yeah. so that twist did, did surprise me I did not see that coming um, just because I, I just assumed oh they're a vampire. Yeah, they're they're an immortal creature. Yeah, but they're a penisless boy. Uh, I I probably shouldn't like attribute too much to this movie. But when I first saw this movie, that was one of the qu like uh, questioning periods of my life. Mm -hmm. And I heard that line: "Would you still like me if I wasn't a girl?" Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've thought about that. What if you ran into somebody, you super vibed with them, you're attracted to them, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden, they're just a little bit different than what you were expecting. Would your feelings change? I just think it's kind of an interestingly positive question. Oscar even talks about it. Now, Beck and I have posed the uh, the question to each other, what if one of us got a sex change? Would that change our relationship? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it would. Um, I mean, it obviously would change our relationship but do i think it would no longer be a romantic relationship no do i identify as a homosexual or bisexual man no but i i do believe that if she suddenly had a penis we would still be in a romantic relationship so i uh when i found out that elay 
was male. I think there was a small bit of confusion. And then I, I think I had a similar reaction that, that Oscar had. Confusion. Then just like the briefest moment of like, what's going on? And then like a really fast acceptance. Like, does ultimately, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, I, you're you're an immortal blood sucking creature. This is the greatest relationship ever. <laughs> and I think that that brief moment of like resistance to the idea isn't because Ile is male, but it's because we were led to believe that they're female because they dress and present themselves as female. I love that the book switches the pronoun usage after the reveal. Yes, <laughs> which also threw me. Like it took me a minute to get oh. Okay, so they are male, so yeah, now we're using and, he. And he identifies as male. Mm -hmm. it, he just presents as female because it seems easier. It, it makes him... It, I'm not trying to be sexist by saying this, but it makes him seem more vulnerable to wear a dress and be a little girl. St statistically, that's just true. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it actually makes the ending of the book stronger that... Uh, Ile is male and identifies as male and Oscar, you know... <laughs> he just rolls with it. He just is, he decides it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's ambiguous if their relationship is still romantic at the end of the book. I probably shouldn't be romanticizing to uh, a 12 and a 13 year old, but... Well, I, again, th we're romanticizing, we're not sexualizing. Yeah. So, so I, I, I want them to work. <laughs> I, I do too. Like I ship them, <laughs> yeah. and I ship them as they are, as as two twelve year old boys. Yeah. Um, but again, like in just saying, it's it's very possible. It's okay to enjoy a romantic relationship between children. We talked and about media. that. We talked about that a lot with uh, Bev and how she was presented. Yeah, and like I love ben and bev and yeah. they're it's just it's when it becomes sexual then it's like ah, okay stephen king let's back up here yeah yeah and, and i just find it this relationship to be one of the sweetest that we've read i think except for maybe ben and bet I mean, in some ways it's probably even better yeah um but it, it's between those two for like the two like best like romantic relationships that we of any of the books we've read. i've also been shipping this since like 2008 so um, John and Jonathan and Mina Harker is also a good one, but yeah, that's not the same, really. Okay, um, Hawken, Hawkins, <laughs> Humbert. Oh my God! Oh, oh my, oh my God! This character. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna let you go off. Well, the character works. Yeah. Until he doesn't. And I, I don't even know exactly. Okay, so Hawken is a familiar and is a pedophile, and I was and I was comparing them to uh, Barlow and Straker a lot, uh, which I think it makes for a very funny comparison. <laughs> um, but we talked about how he he's a pedophile, and it logically it makes sense that. You know, he had this life as a teacher, and then he got out as a pedophile, and he lost his job, and now um, Good. <laughs> he would. Yeah, no, I. You should not work as a it, with kids. No, I'm sorry. Like, uh, but um, then you know he was working on ki drinking himself to death until he found Eli, or really Eli found him, mm. and I think that's one of the moments where they're it, going to be with me now. It makes you think that Ile is more manipulative than they let on because it seems like he targeted uh, Hawken. Yep. Uh, of course, maybe they just got lucky. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, I, I imagine in any event, whether it's like uh, Ile is like super chess master or just really needed somebody, mm -hmm. that they probably watched him for a while. Yeah. I mean, and th I think you would, even if you have the mind of a 12-year-old, you know you can't just go up to any adult. But there are also moments where Eli's like, okay, then I love you, if that's what you need to hear. Yeah, yeah. And then there's moments like, oh, okay, you want me to lay in bed naked with you? Sure, just go kill somebody else for me, because I need you to do it, like, yesterday. I need food. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So I like that he's kind of like the uh, the incompetent familiar because he keeps fucking up. Yeah. He he does manage several murders without getting caught. I, I'm gonna delay a little bit till we talk about the like the attempted murder at the at the pool. But I like no idea how the fuck he thought that was going to work. I'm so glad it didn't. Um, but so before we get to that, I think the early part of the book with him and Elay is gross, but it absolutely makes sense and it works in the story that's being told. Yeah. Okay, so now we get to the pool. He's desperate, and he, when he gets desperate, he gets stupid. Mm -hmm. And he tries to kill this kid in a locker room changing room with other people outside the door. Duh, he gets caught. And he has this backup plan to burn off his face with acid so that he can't get recognized and won't get traced back to Eli. And I think that in and of itself makes sense and works within the story and it shows like his like radical dedication to Eli. He says that he's in love with Eli. Of course, I I don't believe I think he just has a disgusting sexual fixation on Eli. Mm -hmm. But you can burn off your face for a sexual disgusting fixation too. Mm -hmm. Where I take issue is like, so he burns off his face, doesn't die. They get him to a hospital. They're talking about reconstructing his face. I'm like, oh, he's not dead. Well, I mean, I guess he just burned his face off. So sure. He's stuck in a hospital bed. This character is probably out of it. Eli's probably going to show up and drink his blood and he'll, he'll die. And that'll be, that'll be fine. Eli shows up. Eli drinks his blood. He goes falling out of a 10 story window. And John Lindquist describes him as having exploded like a water balloon. Yep. And he's not dead. <laughs> he's carted away to the morgue where the janitor who takes him notices he's bleeding and is like, that's weird that he's bleeding. He fell from a 10-story window. <laughs> he should be licking everywhere. Yeah, it supposedly exploded like a balloon, but no, he's still in one piece. Yeah. And... He's still alive because, not because he's actually alive, but because the vampire virus is like, just like controlling his brain and it's just his baser instincts are making him move and do things, but he's not cognitive anymore. Because his brain died when he hit. Yes. But the vampire brain didn't. I like that the va the vampire virus is like a second brain that forms on their heart. So that made me mad. <laughs> yeah. But I was still like, rationalizing like okay fine but then he shows up to the basement to jerk off <laughs> and there's a very very explicit attempted at rape on Eli very <laughs> um it's pretty graphic it's pretty graphic it's the second most uh graphic uh rape on uh, attempted rape on a child in a book i've read the the worst one was the library policeman which describes uh a a man penetrating a young boy and goes all the way to ejaculation. Gross. Yeah, Stephen King's a gross man. Sex um, pervert. <laughs> yeah, he's a sex pervert. But that, just like the whole, like he shows up at the basement, is jerking off, tries to rape Elay. Elay escapes, and then Tommy comes out of the closet and beats him to death with this trophy. And it Hawken is literally just a mass of flesh and bone on the floor, but is still alive. <laughs> Twitching and moving. It's... I think it's too much. <laughs> I think it's absolutely too much. Uh, I, would you feel better if I told you none of that's in the movies? Yes. <laughs> none of it's in the movies. Good. <laughs> I think... I honestly think the, the perfect resolution for the character is he burns his face off, Eli comes to him in the hospital and drinks his blood and kills him. Yeah, spoilers, that's how it ends in the movies. Good, I mean, that's yeah. just like... that. That's the, the book ended right there. I love it. Eli's like watching him like in the basement and he starts, he's like, oh my God, he has an erection. Oh, he's jerking off. That was a lot of effort to masturbate. <laughs> <laughs> All this effort to come here and jerk off. <laughs> Wait a minute, I didn't say you could come in here. <laughs> It's a public space. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. I didn't think of that. <laughs> I love when Elay invites Oscar into her, their, his apartment. And Oscar says, you have to say you can come in. <laughs> yeah. That was so funny. What, um, I don't know where else to put this. What did, what did you think of the, uh, 
the invitation roll for this book. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it. That's um, underused. I love it in Salem's Lot. I loved it in Renfield. And I love that it gives an actual consequence for if, like... That they bleed to death. Yeah, like some, something has to happen. Yeah. Or it has to be like a psychological compulsion. Or they just can't. Like, yeah. But um, I like that there's a, I like that there's a physical consequence to it. I do too. I don't think that has to be in every single piece of vampire media because sometimes it can just restrict storytelling. Mm -hmm. But I like when it's used, especially when it's used well. And this is probably the best it's ever used. Yep. Yeah. In my limited experience. And it also just goes great with the title. Yeah, let the right one in. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't let the wrong vampire in. Only <laughs> let the right vampire in. Yeah, make sure they're a 12-year-old. <laughs> but you have to be also 12. <laughs> okay, so now we get into the, the characters of the subplots. And I will say, just to start this off, that of the, all the individual subplots... I don't like I don't dislike any of them individually. Yep. But by the end of the book There's so many. There's there's too many. Frankly, the book could have been a little shorter, which usually I'm of the opinion that books should be longer. And I I don't think a lot of them get like any sort of proper resolution. Uh no. And actually that I wasn't gonna bring that up, but I don't think the book itself really has like a clear um Resolution. No, it has oh. a clear resolution, but not a clear... Fuck. God, I don't have words tonight. <laughs> the, uh... The top of the bell. The, uh... The climax? Climax. I don't think it has a clear climax. Okay. Because... Is the climax... Tommy in the basement with Hawkins? Is the climax where... Elay stabs Laka in the bathroom? Is the climax at the pool... Which actually happens in the epilogue. Yeah, I, 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 normally I'd say that the climax is the pool, but it happens in the last chapter of the book. Yeah. It doesn't... That felt like an epilogue. Yeah. More so than, like, a climax. Uh, the storytelling is... It doesn't have the traditional bell curve. Yeah. Uh, which I'm kind of fine with. Um, I like things to be a little experimental. There's a lot of it. Kind of does this, mm -hmm. and there's some there's some down here, and then there's some up here. It absolutely does not ruin the book for me at all. Yeah, but and maybe it's just because I'm so used to that normal structure that that traditional bell curve that it just it feels so weird because it felt like the the thing that felt closest to a climax to me was Tommy's confrontation with. Hawking in the basement because that's like the longest part of the last as part of the book, but it amounts to like a whole lot of nothing. And it also doesn't involve Oscar. Or e well, the, Ile a little bit, a little bit, yeah. But it doesn't involve your two main characters the most. Mm -hmm. It involves this tertiary character that really doesn't do a lot. And I don't dislike Tommy's subplot. Yeah, I don't dislike the subplot of all the the drunks from the Chinese restaurant. I think the the rest of these characters are very good for the themes of the book. It's just, all, it was all a lot. Yeah, yeah. It does make the world feel a little lived in. It's so I feel, and that's where some of the comparisons to uh, Salem's Lot comes in, mm -hmm. where he he's trying to establish all these tertiary characters and explain their backgrounds. I just don't think he's as good at, at it as Stephen King is. The, where they're different it, in Salem's Lot, it's I'm more interested in the subplots of the tertiary characters and than it. In this, it's the reverse. I care more about Oscar and Elay. I think Oscar's a better protagonist than Ben. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, that's not but, hard. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that, like, all the uh, the vignettes in Salem's Lot are, are more interesting than the ones in this. Yeah. Uh, especially because so many of the the vignettes, the, like, the side characters, are trying to tie back directly into the main conflict. Yeah, with which they do. I was going to say, I mean, they do, but with middling success and how I feel about them. Yeah. But Tommy, he's a thief. He sells stuff to Oscar. That's his character. He's a he's a teenager yeah. with fatherlessness issues. Yeah, 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 he has fatherless behavior. He he steals shit. He sniffs glue. 
and his mom is getting remarried and he doesn't like his new stepdad but yeah he's not handling it yep. well i mean i've been there yeah it's it's rough uh, i didn't lash out in this way mm -hmm. but i also still had a dad mm -hmm. so big difference yep um so laka in virginia i think of the various subplots this one was my favorite i really really liked virginia's story of turning into a vampire and just having no idea what the fuck was happening to her. <laughs> yeah. I love when she she's drinking her own blood. I love when she tries to go to work. <laughs> I love that she tries to go kill the dude with all the cats and it just <laughs> blows up in her fucking face. Uh, I also love their relationship. It is super cute. It's a very unconventional relationship. And it's like the exact opposite of Oscar and Eli, where they're both... 50 something people who've had rough and shitty lives and they're just finding comfort in each other and they've also been on and off again mm -hmm. over the years um i've been in an on and off again relationships a lot and uh there's just these these moments where it's almost tragic that they can't make it work mm -hmm. because you can tell that they kind of want to make it work but there's these instances where She's like, are you just using me? And he goes, well, if you tell me to leave, I will leave. And so she told him to leave. And so and he, he left. left. They, they didn't see each other for two years. And then there was uh, when they get, all get drunk and he's crying over his dead friend. And he and, tells her off. And he's just like, oh, you could go fuck any trucker you want. Yeah. yeah. You're not a real friend. Which he doesn't mean. He was just being stupid drunk and he was grieving. Yeah. Um... But I completely understand her react, and that's what gets her attacked by a vampire. So I'll talk about Virginia first. I think, in terms of like heroic, like selfless suicides, she is up there with like Dana Jurgens from The Stand. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I have never seen anything like that. Like, if you think of it, record your reaction when you watch it in the movies. Okay. But she, she's asking the nurse, can you take him out? No, I can't take him. Can you please just take him out? No, I can't get him. Fine. Will you open the blinds? And that's when I realized what was happening. I'm like, oh my God. I wish I could have seen the look on that nurse's face. And then she was up in flames. <laughs> oh my God. That had to hurt so bad. Um, but then also on Laka, God, this guy, his best friend is murdered. His on again, off again, love of his life is turned into a vampire and has to kill herself. And then he just gets iced in the chest by a little blood covered vampire kid. After getting smacked with a Rubik's cube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, God, I feel so bad for him. <laughs> and he's just trying to avenge the love of his life. But he, I'm like... Dude, maybe you shouldn't drink first. Yeah. Well, he's an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we don't have to talk about all the other ones, but there's also Larry and Morgan. Yeah. There's the one who initially gets murdered. Yaka. Yaka. It, it's not spelled how it sounds. It goes, Is it with a J? It's something weird like that. And then there's the one with all the cats, which I, I will say I have two cats and I struggle with the cat smell, but 28 cats in one apartment. Why don't you get them fixed? How would I do that? <laughs> Put them on in a bag. <laughs> you take them two at a time. Yeah. That's how you do it. That guy is social isolation, the character. <laughs> yeah. Where, where that point became too much for me is where it's describing how the cats are so inbred that they're born dead and the pregnant cat it just has a belly full of dead cats. Yeah. And I... Uh, and then it gets kicked in the stomach. I, I couldn't pro like that was in this. Maybe this is says something bad about me, but that was almost as hard for me to process as the library scene. Like it was so bad for me. This is is pretty bad. It it's also written super gross. Yeah, um, and then they all attack Virginia, and it's just like just all of that was. I don't. We're going to talk about this in scary shit, but that was like, it wasn't so much scary as it was just like super disturbing and unnerving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I didn't write down all the, but we talked about Johan, one of the, like, the, the not great bullies. The only ones I wrote down were Johnny and Jimmy, the two brothers. Yeah, and they're... We, we've already kind of talked about them. I mean, they're bullies. And then Stefan, I... Yeah, he's the police. He's the egotistical cop who... I, I will say that I was convinced that he lied to Tommy's mom and that he was actually going to wait for her to go to sleep and then go see Tommy. Mm -hmm. So during all of that shit that was happening, I expected him to walk in in the middle of. Like, when Eli was sucking Tommy's blood, mm -hmm. I expected him to walk in. When Hawkins was in there tr uh, trying to rape Eli, I expected him to walk in. When Tommy was fighting for his life against Hawkins, I expected... And it never happened. No, you just kind of ineffectual. Yeah. Um, and I actually think, to, I honestly think it would have been a little better if he would have walked in on one of those scenes, but... Try shooting a vampire. It doesn't work. Nope, doesn't work. All right. We're over an hour in. Let's move on. Yep. I'll kill you all! <laughs> I'll drive you crazy, and I'll kill you all! I'm every nightmare you ever had. I am your worst dream come true. I'm everything you ever were afraid of. Scary shit, is this book scary? I think that there are certain aspects that can be very terrifying, such as the visceral depiction to death, especially uh, Hawkins murdering children, uh, bleeding them out like stuffed pigs. Uh, the fact that people like Hawkins exist terrifies me. So, to me, it's more disturbing than scary. Mm -hmm. The book didn't like give me nightmares. But I also wouldn't argue with somebody who said that this book was very scary. To me, it was more like it just, like, made my skin crawl, set my teeth on edge. Like, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's the gross stuff. It's like, it's Hawken and the library scene and how he treats uh, Elay and what he does with the kid in the woods, what he does with the kid at the pool. Like, and the fact that, and also the fact that he was watching those kids get changed without them knowing he was there, and that he just fucking ejaculates with, like, without touching himself at all. And it's just like, dude, take a cold shower and get some help. Yeah, dude, calm down. Um, and then the scene with the cats was absolutely too much. Yep. Um, and then it's just something that I found was effective was when it describes how t Tommy was so scared he shit himself. <laughs> yeah. And I thought John didn't go there, but I thought Hawken was going to pin Tommy down and try and sodomize him <laughs> with his shit covered ass. <laughs> Cause that's where I expected this book to go. That's how it, it, and it didn't. So good on you, John. But that's what I expected. <laughs> Sodomize that shit covered ass. I could be like, oh, you're so wet, Tommy. <laughs> it's the it's just lube. It's just like it's good. That's why he couldn't get an Eli because he Eli was just too dry. Yeah. Just, you need some shit to. Oh my god. <laughs> um. But yes, I mean, but thinking about that the people like Hawken really exist is the absolute worst. I, I listened to this uh, um, podcast called True Spies, which is about real life spies. And one of the first episodes is a interview with a guy who was an FBI agent who did deep undercover in Nambla for like two or three years. I forgot Nambla was a real thing. And if you don't, that's the North American Man Boy Love Association. Yeah. You may have known them from their, their South Park episode is a real thing. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to listen to. I didn't have to, but yeah, but it, you did, you, but I did. And the, the, Nam the Nambla guys would have this meetup in New York city where they would uh, meet up at Grand Central Station okay. and there's a Toys R Us like a couple blocks away from there and the Toys R Us it's probably not there anymore because Toys R Us closed but it was multi-floor it, it had multiple floors and had a Ferris wheel in the store uh -huh. and they would go to the top floor and oogle all the little boys 
that uh, were riding the Ferris wheel. And so, and he was deep undercover for years. So he had to pretend to be like them. And he had to make those comments too and say, well, what I want to do, what I want to do to these kids, what I want to have these kids do to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And he thought every time, and they did that like a couple times a year. And that was like always the first, whenever they'd have their weekends in New York, that was the first thing they would do. And he said, like, every time we did that, I just thought about taking each of those guys and throwing them off the balcony. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, oh. They'd live, though. They'd become back as <laughs> fans. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pedophile's scary. Kiss me, fat boy. Where do I even start? Uh, I feel like we've talked about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, I wrote down that the book sometimes links sex and violence in a Freudian way, but I feel like we've just kind of naturally talked about that. It actually uh, reminds me of Blade Trinity. (laughs) And uh, when Blade is in custody and the psychiatrist, like... It, like sits him down is like is this about sex it seems like it's very sexual to me like uh is that is that why you like all this vampire stuff blade because it's all about sex i don't remember exactly what yeah. it says but that scene kept running through my head uh stupid blade trinity um yes what you said is accurate <laughs> and we already talked about how oscar asks his teacher what about if you like a boy which the teacher has like a knee jerk kind of negative reaction to and then you can kind of I kind of picture in my head the teacher like taking a breath and then going back and kind of saying the right thing no wonder he gets bullied (laughs) (laughs) that's what I pictured but at the same time the book takes place in 1981 also like I when I was in middle school I did not have the best opinions and ideas on homosexuality. Yeah. You probably used a slur a time or two. Yeah. Yeah. That was a word that just people I pl- just used. I also played Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't for me, it wasn't until I got to high school and I actually met people who were gay or mm-hmm. bi and it was just like, oh, these are people. Uh, for me, it was discovering femboys. And I just was like, guess a dick's not a deal breaker. Yeah. <laughs> the power of Christ compels you! The, the power, power of Christ compels you! The power of Christ compels you. Uh, Stefan, there's Christian imagery. It, there's an odd amount of Christian imagery in this book. It doesn't amount to a whole lot. Yeah, it, kind of going back to Blade, it's like, the holy water and the crosses don't do anything to or you would assume they don't do it it's not something that's tried yeah and, and actually that's a way in which this book is kind of unusual because it doesn't discuss how to kill vampires like at all really yeah um well it, it does and it doesn't it doesn't talk about like does garlic or holy water or crosses does that kill vampires but it does in that Hawkins like is like fucking unkillable. Yeah. So it, it seems like killing the heart is how it mentions little things like the virus makes a new brain around your heart. And that's what like drives you to drink blood. Mm-hmm. So that's where like the stakes of the heart thing comes from. Yeah. And the only thing that we actively see able to kill vampires is sunlight. Right. Um, so that is like the one big trope. Yeah. Doesn't sleep in a coffin. Sleeps in a bathtub full of blood. <laughs> I love that imagery. It works. Yeah. Uh, I've seen the posters for both the movies in the the later one. Yeah, the American one. Yeah. They, it, they really focus on that. Yeah, that's because that's what the poster is. Uh, okay. Eli is described as an angel throughout the book, and at the end, they even say, not one from heaven, then. Unless you're Oscar. That's say, heaven, baby. Say that I can come in. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do imagine if Elaine was ever able to grow up and 
Eli and Oscar did have like an adult sexual relationship, that would be something that they would playfully say to each other in bed. That's why vampires can't get pregnant. <laughs> they can in Blade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they always give them permission. Yep. <laughs> Oh my god, are you Stephen King? No, I'm Dean Koontz. Oh. All right, Kings and Koontz, if I said anything other than Oscar and Elay, yeah, it's also I, mine. I would just be completely full of shit. That is also mine. Koontz, the, the lack of a clear climax bothers me, but not as... And also, like, the multitude of subplots bothers me even though none of them i think are bad but it just had i think it had for me it has to be hawk and the terminator just mine similar i think that there's just some fat on this book that you could have trimmed away mm -hmm. which is a novel it is a novel and novel it, it, i'd rather have a novel with extra fat than a movie with extra fat yeah generally speaking um because at least and usually I would say it either needs to be longer or shorter, but there are just things that I go, I feel this could have just been cut. Yeah, it's not so much that it could be shorter as just like this just doesn't need to be in here. Yeah. Um, and it, aside from the Hawkins stuff, like not, like I said, I don't think any of it is bad. It's just that it makes the book drag a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, rankings, I did do mine. It... it it is pretty decent. It's my new number 11. Pretty good. Uh, just below the Only Good Indians. To me, it's very similar to the Only Good Indians in that it's just like an author I've never read before from like a cultural background that I'm not familiar with. It, this book is not in steeped, it, steeped in Swedish culture the same way that the Only Good Indians is in indigenous culture, but still just like from a culture that I'm not very familiar with and just kind of enjoyed way more than I kind of initially thought I would. Yeah. Um, and then I have it just above Firestarter and I I really debated about which one I like more, this one or Firestarter. And honestly, I think if you ask me tomorrow, I might say I like Firestarter more, but they're like right on the same level. I think this makes sense because Oscar was reading Firestarter. That mm -hmm. means that that's fiction and this really happened yep <laughs> yep and also i love that he was reading firestarter and then just decided i'm, I'm gonna fucking burn these kids desk <laughs> fuck you kids i bought all those problems i have now i'm an arsonist too <laughs> i'm a firebug he's a weird kid who does fatherless behavior <laughs> yeah so number 11 out of 31 books so yeah this book is really good i highly recommend it um mine mine's gonna end up being pretty high um i think I'm putting it right above Frankenstein for my new number seven. Below the Mist and above Frankenstein. Which uh, now pushes Ringu out of the top ten. Oh, sad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I expected you to have it very high. I actually thought it might even be a little higher than that. It, it, it almost was. I just sat there and thought, it's not a it's it's an imperfect book. Yeah. What, where does it compare to Dracula? And I'm like, Dracula is just like the classic, mm -hmm. and it's the classic for a reason. Yeah. So. Nope. That makes sense. I I like both of those. Okay. Zombie Day. Uh, Oscar is reading. Fire, fire Star, yeah. He also read Goosebumps. <laughs> He's a time traveler. <laughs> Oscar is a time lord. <laughs> he read the Hulk, but I I the Hulk existed in 1981. He would that he he got the goosebumps from a time traveling Craigslist. The guy, yeah, that guy. That's why the guy wouldn't talk to him because he was a time traveler and he didn't want to screw up this timeline. <laughs> He's but he knew that he had to give Oscar these goosebump books to help prepare him for his um, encounter with Eli. Okay, all right. This could be a side story. Uh, homework pick a vampire rule or weakness and explain what happens if the rule is broken or if the vampire is exposed to the weakness in your vampire universe so like yeah what's your if, i have to come in rule yeah okay um so it's not that 
vampires don't have a reflection. Mm -hmm. They actually do. The issue is that all vampires are egomaniacs, but they also are have like, they're egomaniacs and they have no self-confidence, so they can't actually look in themselves in the mirror because they will just go insane by uh, criticizing themselves because they can never measure up to their own self-image. So that's why they don't have any mirrors in their house. That's why they don't look in mirrors, not because they don't have a reflection, but they just can't process their own reflection. I, I like yours. I, I was going to do uh, running water, how they can't cross bodies of water. Underused. Yeah. Uh, so what happens is, is if they cross the uh, bodies of water, they start pissing themselves uncontrollably. Mmm. I like it. Yeah. That's it. Do is they it? urinate? Yes. Oh. Uh, and the only way to stop it is they have to get a piss ball. <laughs> they. It is established that they can drink water. Yeah. Virginia didn't enjoy it. It's just tasteless. Yeah, but she but it, can drink it. It didn't make her sick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question for the listeners. Ile from Freaks, Freaks and Geeks. Geeks. I have not seen that show. Versus Ile from Let the Right One In. Okay. It's the battle of the century. <laughs> Hold on. I know a lot of famous actors are in this show. So I'm just going to see who that is real quick. Yeah, I don't know who that is. <laughs> like, oh, no, that's Ben Foster. Yeah, I looked at that dweeb. Yeah, I love Ben Foster. Ben Foster is great. There's this Bruce Willis movie called Hostage. Yeah. Where he he kidnaps a bunch of kids. It's really cool. Is one is one of them a vampire? Uh, yes. <laughs> He's also the villain in the Dan Brown movie Inferno. Okay. So, you know, like the the Dan Brown stereotype that the Paul Bettany character and yeah. he's that character okay. in Inferno. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he's I like him a lot. I really need to read Inferno. I was thinking maybe we should do that for the show cuz it's I was and I was even think I don't know if we should do this but what if we actually read Dante's Inferno and then read Don Br Dan Brown's Inferno. I kind of I kind of love that. Yeah. We can at least talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Uh, I have read Dante's Inferno, but not in a long time. I, I like it, but it's kind of a slog. It is, but if we got it on audiobook, and I bet there's a free version. Inferno. So there's that. Okay. The Inferno. So that one's not free. That is the World of War. That's about World War Two. Dante Alligator. That one's three dollars. That's not bad. Two ninety nine. Let me filter it free. No. No. Okay. <laughs> so there's not a free one, but I, th I there might be one on YouTube or there is one on here for three dollars. Yeah, three bu three bucks I'll spend for the Inferno. And how long is three dollars? It's four hours. Yeah, I could listen to that in a couple of days. Okay. Wish list. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We'll talk about that. Uh, further reading, Salem's Lot, and you, you said Salem's Lot and Twilight. I was going to say Salem's Lot and Carmilla. Carmilla's a good one. Um, I, I only use Twilight because I think it's a good way to pitch it to people who might not otherwise read it. I think there is, for that, like, Twilight YA crowd, I think because of Oscar and Eli's relationship, there is some appeal there, some mm -hmm. crossover. But then there's also all the gross shit. You have to get over Hawkin. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe the movies. The movies are so good. Uh, maybe watch the movies, and then if you really like the movies, you can read the book. I don't know. Haven't watched them yet, but. Okay. Aside from. Uh making Oscar super skinny. That's, that's my goodness. They do that always. I know, but it upsets me. Yeah, it upsets me too. Alright. Upcoming on the Horror of Babylon, our next two Sunday episodes on Sunday, December 31st, we are going to do a double feature episode on the American and Swedish versions of the movie, Let the Right One In and Let Me In. 
And then the next Sunday is Sunday, January 7th. It's the first Sunday in January, which means we are doing our next episode in the Dark Tower series. We are officially starting the for real Dark Tower with The Gunslinger by <laughs> Stephen King. My blade sword is still in my car. I wouldn't drive around. I wouldn't drive around with that. I keep forgetting it's in yeah. there. I. I mean, you just like. What if you have like a tail light out and a cop pulls you over to tell you your tail light's out? I'm allowed to have swords in my car. Okay. I mean, I don't know the law on that, but I'm just assuming I. I wouldn't want to have that interaction, regardless if it's legal or not. <laughs> Usually, cops are like, "Do you have anything in your car?" I'm like, "Yeah, I have like three guns in here." And then they just go, oh, step out of the car, sir. Every time. Yeah, I just, I just don't have a gun in my car, so I've not, I've not done that before. Where are they? Okay, you got one under the seat. There's one in the glove box, and then there's the one strapped to my ankle. You have one on your person, sir. You have the license, <laughs> and I mean, I know you can have a license for that. Yeah, you don't need one in West Virginia. Conce my dad had a concealed weapons license. Yeah, we became two years, I think it's two, three years ago, we're a constitutional carry state now. Gross. So you don't need a concealed weapons permit to carry anymore. Yeah, I don't like that. So I just let mine expire. Um, I actually, I think I knew that already because I, I had a, we were at a pizza place a couple years ago and there was this like, the table next to us, there was this guy with a huge, huge beer belly. Mm -hmm. And after he'd eat pizza, he'd go like, like this. And he had a gun, like, right there. Yeah. And it wasn't concealed at all. I mean, it was concealed by his fat belly when he wasn't stretching. But I, I had this moment where it's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I got to tell somebody. I got I to gotta call the cops. I got to wait. Wait a minute. No, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. You live in West Virginia. Yeah. He's, the, dude, the dude has a gun on him. He's not here to shoot everybody. I don't like it. But he's just... He just has a gun. Yeah. It, guns make me nervous. Oh, okay. Um, speaking of People being... People who make us nervous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you to our good friends and patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and... Mm. Logan, the, the full, full metal, metal patron. patron. I want pizza. <laughs> and Ben, the, the fourth, fourth patron of pizza. <laughs> Bring us a pizza. You, you know what? Just skip the next like couple months of Patreon payments and just send a pizza. I have I ate a pretzel pizza before I came over here. <sighs> I hate eating those because it just makes me feel so bad about myself. But, <laughs> Same. but they're so good. Whenever we actually sit down and watch movies or play Magic sometime, we should just order like 10 of those. We are going to pick a Friday and do Luann Lu Noodles and Season of the Witch and Pizza and Beers. <laughs> play Legacy. Yeah, we'll, we'll play some Magic too. Yeah. We'll start earlier. Uh, oh, but not to uh, not to leave out Mia the, the Fifth, fifth the rain Rainmaker. She makes it rain pizza. Oh, oh my god. She'd be my She's my she's my new king, like number one on everything. Uh, I got to work with her last night. We were on the same floor. Cool. It was great. Uh, and thank you to Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, the Mall at Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You can shop online at shop.fourhorsemancomics.com. And if you make it into the store, say hello to Ronkins, uh, Rumbert Ronkins. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't tie up kids in the back for his vampire? I was gonna, who is officially banned from the Morgantown City swimming pool, <laughs> but not for the reasons you think. I, I will just tell you it involved a piss ball. <laughs> I, I kind of want to try it. <laughs> um, yeah. I feel like it'd be super uncomfortable, but I'm like. I think you'd forget about it after a while. How absorbent is this? It's definitely not absorbent enough for like a full Bladder. adult male urination. So I find it hard to stop these days too. So it's going to be hard to try like a spritz. Yeah. Yeah. Same. It's just something that happens as you get older. I, I woke up like three hours early today because I had to pee. And every time I get up to pee, I can't go back to sleep. Yeah, I've had that issue, but I... 
but I just I drink more water now than I ever have in my life. Same. But because it helps with everything else. Yeah. Oh. All right. Nobody wants to hear about our middle aged. Thanks for rereading Let the Right One In by John Lenquist in recording with me tonight. It was a good time. Thank you to our patrons. Stay tuned for our socials. I can hear Drake running around over my head, and it's almost midnight, so it's time to go. Stay scary. Stay scary. I cannot believe we talked this long. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and all other major podcast apps. Stay scary. Mm-hmm.